What started as an under-the-table project disguised as a few vibrant 3D kart races early in the PlayStation's life cycle, Polly's Entertainment spent five years practically trapped in the office led by Kazunori Yamauchi, motivated to make something that fulfilled his lifelong fascinations for cars, motorsport and 3D graphics. It became a staple for every PlayStation console today. That was Gran Turismo, and when it released for the PlayStation in 1997, it completely revolutionized the genre. With the most detailed real-life cars with environmental mapping, physics, and just sheer volume of content compared to its rivals. In fact, there was no rival. However, despite the game selling better than any other in the PlayStation's life cycle at the time when the arcade racing genre reigned supreme, Yamauchi had a different perspective. With launch day being the most stressful part of game design as it would for nearly every developer, despite five years of work and the overwhelming success it generated for Sony and the PlayStation, Yamauchi was frustrated with the final product, always thinking, hmm, we should have done this or we should have done that, and they didn't reach the maximum potential of the PlayStation hardware. And that's where the motivation for a sequel came from, which was officially announced on February 1999. The success of the predecessor turned Polly's Entertainment from a development group within Sony Computer Entertainment offices to a full-fledged first-party subsidiary, Polyphony Digital. And with a lot more staff, resources, and a worldwide audience, Yamauchi and his team sought to make a sim racer that would appeal to that demographic, not just Japan. And how did they do that? By creaming everything they could possibly program so that it works on the PlayStation. They planned to have over 400 cars on 20 tracks, which was ungodly for a console exclusive back in the 90s. It ended up having even more than that. They stepped out of their apartments, I mean offices, flying to the states and visiting Laguna Seca for game testing, vehicle data, and including it in the game itself, with Yamauchi calling it a dream come true to drive the famous corkscrew with a Dodge Viper, and introduced rally racing which has become a staple throughout the rest of the series. Actually, Gran Turismo 2 is also notable for what could have been with a lot of unused data either cut or hidden in the game's code. I like this background of what appears to be Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I wonder if a licensed Indy 500 endurance event was being negotiated by IndyCar LLC. Drag racing was also planned with this car being included in the final cut, but only good for one event set on the test course. My guess is Polyphony wanted every racing type possible, endurance, rally, drag racing, drift events, maybe demolition derby, the lot. But with everything that didn't make the final cut, what's left is a game that you technically can't 100% complete because the rush to meet the 1999 Christmas deadline led to numerous glitches and bugs like Y2K arrived ahead of schedule. The ones I noticed personally in this playthrough include grammar errors, trophy icons being out of place, some events and license tests they just start instantly before you have a chance to blink. That's one way to get you on your toes. And there's also one where certain vehicles appear in events that thanks to power restrictions make the race virtually impossible to beat. And another where environmental mapping on the cars are incorrectly matched, making the car's reflections look all over the place. If downloadable updates existed back then, they would have very likely fixed them. The sort of thing today that's easily taken for granted when you think about it. It's really hard to keep up when you've got so much content for a PS1 game and have to meet a deadline with only one chance. From having two CDs, one simply dedicated to the Gran Turismo mode, then you know just how jam-packed this game is for a sim racer. It wasn't uncommon for a PlayStation game to have multiple CDs, Metal Gear Solid, Final Fantasy VII, Resident Evil 2, some of the most beloved PS1 titles as obvious examples, but I guess you could say Gran Turismo 2 and Driver 2, now that I think about it, were the only ones of its genre. Cool looking CD art, one red and one blue, like the Gran Turismo logo, which by today's standards reminds me of the GT7 cover. Oh yeah, and I'm still wondering what it means by smelling real. Supposedly you can rub the CD and it's meant to smell of the pit lane, though I couldn't get anything out of it. Either that or I haven't been near an actual pit lane in years to make a proper judgement. Let's go straight to the GT mode disc since it's the one most people would choose first. Oh my god, these menu sound effects are the definition of nostalgic. So, welcome to driving heaven. Just looking at different parts of the city, the new manufacturers which have all been separated based on region. That's what I call a planned city. You might also notice that the music in the menu is more relaxing than the predecessor, or more specifically, it sounds similar to the Japanese version. And it's the sort of music composed by Isamu Uhura that is synonymous with the whole franchise. And a lot of it is remixed in later titles. 
While the OST in the first Gran Turismo in retrospective helps distinguish it from the rest of the series, in GT2 it's a more appropriate way to fit the mood of just browsing a car showroom before going out on track to the most 90s music I've ever heard. If only the game's soundtrack wasn't separated by regions, I would have loved the North American soundtrack. I mean, that's not to say the PAL soundtrack is bad or anything, but the only reason it has the music that it has here is because they're instrumentals, which is handy for non-English speaking players. I don't see any other reason. People like to debate which region has the best licensed soundtrack like any video game that has one, but the way I see it, if you grew up playing Gran Turismo 2 in a certain region, of course the one you grew up with is going to be your favourite. Honestly, they're all good. The only thing I don't get, however, is that during a race, the same song loops endlessly until you cross the finish line, including the endurance ones. I assume this is another bug in the game, with the developers forgetting to program it so that the songs change in the middle of the race. The GT mode in terms of what you need to do is pretty much the same, earn a license, buy a first car for peanuts, and lo and behold, there's a lot more to do in Gran Turismo 2. The way the events are set up, unlike the predecessor and the rest of the series, even though they're categorised based on drive, train, nationality, body type, and even road terrain, thanks to the introduction of rally racing as well, which I'll get to, unlike the predecessor where each event used a championship format, most of them in GT2 use single races where each one has a brake horsepower limit, giving you a good excuse to drive lots of different cars throughout the GT mode. However, what I found odd is that apart from the events that return from the predecessor, the National Drive Train Lightweight, you get the idea. The rest of them, more specifically the car body types, your convertible, muscle and luxury cups, brake horsepower is the only restriction. As you can see, I'm using an Aston Martin DB7 to race against a bunch of station wagons, but I can do that because it meets the power limit. I'm going to assume this is another example of the game being rushed for release and the developers forgot to add those specific restrictions like the rest of the series have. But hey, the good thing about the GT mode in a Gran Turismo title is every playthrough is different to the next person, so there's nothing stopping you from playing the game as if those restrictions do exist, which I'm doing in this playthrough because the game and the footage would be boring to watch if I were driving, what, three, four, five cars the entire review? And what's the point when there are, according to the game's cover, over 600 cars to drive in a PS1 game? Again, I wonder how many of them put race or tuner modified versions into consideration, like Mines, Toms, or Spoon. But regardless of what the true number is, this game has a ridiculous volume of cars, even by today's standards. Obviously, there are way more Japanese cars, which is fair enough, but there are more than enough by the rest of the world to make up for it. Since the first game with real-life cars, brands, and sponsors sold better than any other game on the PlayStation, you bet more car manufacturers wanted their badge on it too. With the number of them in Gran Turismo 2 literally tripling from the predecessor. I'd say pretty much every single manufacturer that wasn't an Italian supercar appears here. Yamauchi wanted to make a driver's game where the person can fill in every curiosity, whether it's driving the car he or she owns or is planning to buy or is beyond the realms of realistic. There's a reason it's called the real driving simulator. And it only occurred to me while writing the script, all the cars in the first Gran Turismo, the year they're all made, vary between the late 80s to the late 90s. Basically around when the game was being developed. It's crazy because we're so used to Gran Turismo titles these days where the showroom resembles a driver's playground with one car for every era and part of the world. But it was GT2 that started the trend. I mean, just imagine being in the shoes of Kichi Ashizawa, scanning all these cars. According to Ashizawa, it would take a week to gather all the details of a car and copy everything into a 3D model on a computer, with some taking a month to design. Over 600 of them with 1990s technology just insane. And it carries all the revolutionary graphical trademarks from the predecessor, including physics where the car's body and wheels react to the surface of the road, and environmental mapping on the body, although the reflection in GT2 looks even more exaggerated, like every single paint job is a metallic one when driving in the afternoon. And with some circuits, textures pop in very late, which give it a short draw distance during gameplay. Just little things like that which label the game a rush product, but sometimes associate the game in a good way. I mean, it is 22 years old at the time of this review, good lord. I know all the returning circuits look exactly the same, but if you look at the new ones, the overall look is a graphical improvement from the predecessor. Cars look more rounded and detailed, and was certainly the closest thing to real life driving back then. 
and it's great to see not just more cars, but circuits to drive them on as well. 24 in total, and that's not including variations, or the fact that most of them can be raced in reverse, with Special Stage Route 11 being the only omission. That was a difficult circuit, especially that double chicane part which was easy to screw up. One thing I also noticed is the increased dependence on street circuits. It took me a long time to figure out that every single fictional street circuit are actually all based on real life street layouts. Rome, Seattle, and later throughout the series, Tokyo, Paris, Hong Kong, Seoul, Madrid, and Rome again. I mean, I sorta of knew that later on in the series, just not as early as Gran Turismo 2. There's certainly an increased variety in the circuits, adding more opportunities for variations, a speedway, a real life one, Laguna Seca, which they also did a lot of the car tests for, and some of them are exclusive to Gran Turismo 2, including Red Rock Valley, Grindelwald, and Rome Knight. Makes you wonder why they didn't reappear in Gran Turismo 3. But another debut inclusion that would be a staple to the series is the rally genre. And that's where I spent most of my time during my earliest experiences with the GT series, thanks in small part to my love of dirt bikes. It might not be as accurate as a World Rally Championship heat, apart from the hill climbs. Like, I didn't expect the events in Gran Turismo 2 to be just a one lap time attack against the ghosts, but they had to start somewhere, I guess. Since most races are between 2-5 to five laps, the Gran Turismo mode is basically a playful collection of quick bursts of action on the track. I know looking at the gameplay it might not appear as exciting as Crash Team Racing, but playing this game is different from watching the gameplay. However, the most common complaint with the Gran Turismo series in general is the time it takes to get yourself up and running in the GT mode with cars that are actually worth driving. And in GT2 it takes even longer, to the point where you start questioning if it's worth putting the time in. Firstly, the number of license tests has gone up from 24 to 60, with multiple repeats of the same test just with a different car, including those introductory stop starts. Okay, I'm going to assume that rolling starts were originally going to be in GT2 before being cut from the final game, since there are a few events that do the same thing. Anyway, do you know what? I'll cut the license test part of the game some slack because it is an improvement from the predecessor. They're a lot easier to pass with more forgiving time limits, either that or the driving mechanics are better. There are only two tests I remember struggling to pass, the slalom cones and the last one with this Toyota GT1 Le Mans racer. And the tests in question have their own piece of track which makes it feel less repetitive, like complex string in Gran Turismo 3. Maybe this is partly why the GT mode is set on a separate CD, all the different little parts that are unnecessary in the arcade mode. And as an added bonus, there's a driving strategy guide in the game's case, including general car physics, racing lines with mini illustrations of the ideal lines around certain corners, and explanations to different car upgrades. And while researching the game, I found out this part was inspired by Yamauchi's experience with driving school ran by pro race driver Takashi Ohi. It's another real life aspect put into video game form. So even though I don't like this part of the game, things like that scream love and passion for cars by the staff in Polyphony Digital, so you have to respect it. And again, as a platform to learn how to drive cars properly when you're new to the genre, of course license tests belong here. You need a license not to just drive a car, but to race in motorsport. But I still maintain that it should only be optional because those who have played the game religiously, making a new save file should not have to go through the same tedious test when you already know how going around corners, racing lines, all that stuff works. Most of the time it barely matters anyway because the rubber banding, at least for the first few hours of gameplay, is just as bad as the predecessor. As early as the Sunday Cup, apart from Tahiti Road, they're right on your tail and it's the last corner that makes the difference between winning and losing. And again, look at the gap between first to last. In fact, here's a situation where I have the lead almost instantly, yet opponents keep up with you the entire race, just like the predecessor. But another thing I noticed is if you look behind just after going around the corner, you see the opponents ramming into barriers or off the track because they're going too fast. And look at all the cars bunched up together like that, first to last in one corner, or sliding out here and retaking the lead on the other side of the track. It doesn't even try to hide it. And even though the game doesn't exactly say so, this sort of thing encourages dirty driving. 
And even if you eventually earn a few trophies, prize money is low, so having to do the same event more than once is a guarantee. And I understand how that can turn players away, especially today. Even if you perform just a few of the license tests, it can take a few hours just to save up for another car to enter anything else other than the Sunday or Clubman Cup. I will concede that the way I usually approach the GT mode might not be the most recommended way. I passed all the license tests before entering the Sunday Cup and tried to save up for the best car imaginable as early as possible. Other factors include having the music turned off during gameplay because copyright, which makes this part of the grind feel even more boring than usual. The same circuit is being used more often than it should, and for some reason in the GT mode specifically, you never race them in reverse like the rest of the series, including the predecessor. For those who play Gran Turismo 2 religiously, do you ever notice that? I know it might sound like a stupid nitpick, but reverse variations help spice up the variety, and it's just weird that the rest of the series implements it, but not this one. Probably just another oversight caused by the rush developed. At one point, the first few hours felt like such a grind, I seriously considered going back to my old save profile and just revisit all the previous events with an already stacked garage full of fast cars from reviewing this game back in 2015 to save time for this review. After all, it's not exactly cheating if it's my own save profile. But at least that makes a good point of how tedious it is to get yourself up and running compared to the first Gran Turismo. Probably because that one had less events and cars. But for the sake of authentically going through that grind again for this review with a different experience and perspective, I persevered. And once you finally discover that all the other events, apart from the Sunday and Clubman Cups, even if you replay the same race, you still earn the same prize car over and over. So what might look like like a 10,000 credit prize for winning, there's another 25,000 under the table as well. I finally saved up enough credits to purchase the Suzuki Escudo Pikes Peak Rally Car, which not only helped with the hardest events, but also found another get rich quick scheme, which made acquiring the other dream cars a lot easier from that point. Eventually becoming everything as to why you bought Gran Turismo 2 in the first place. Side note, this was also the first time I found out most dealerships had more than one special car. I failed to notice the arrow up here. You think could be a lineup like the others. This could be seen as a bad thing since one, all you're doing throughout the GT mode is working out which event gets you the most money in the shortest amount of time, calculating circuit length, cash, and the car you're driving, and two, where's the competition? But I see it as wanting to get to the cars you actually want to drive faster. Or well, like motorsport in real life, it's all about knowing the rules you're given and trying to loophole through them as much as possible to give yourself an advantage. If you're allowed to enter an event with an Escudo Rally Raid car because there's no horsepower limit, then it's technically not cheating. There's a bit of fun in finding that too. We all have that for our favorite Gran Turismo games. And GT2 gets away with it because being out there on the track, driving the cars themselves more than makes up for it, even though you just just doing the same thing with different cars. There's still a cool sense of collecting in this game, even during the grinding phase, and when you eventually unlock the said 900 horsepower rocket ship with wheels, you go through a cycle of earning a couple of prize cars, and they're fast enough for the other events, you earn more prize cars, suddenly you're finally in the groove of things, and you'll be spending the other 80% of the game collecting and driving your favorites. Everything is simple and easy to comprehend, despite the overwhelming volume of content that needs two CDs to contain it. The Presentation, the menus, the easy listening music, and despite the heavy focus on simulation, even the driving mechanics are straightforward, like a hybrid of simulation and arcade. Sure, cars over and understeer, you obviously have to control it like a real life one. They're affected by drivetrain, you have the same options of tuning, machine tests, upgrades. Even as a casual player, you can tell how each one is working and not just in the power department. Yet it's kept simple enough that it's still fun as a video game. That's another sound effect that defines Gran Turismo 2, the turbo whale. I'm only really summarizing the driving mechanics because in Gran Turismo 2, apart from the rally parts where you're obviously sliding around a lot more off, they're very similar to the predecessor, only they're less likely to oversteer and don't differentiate between the GT and arcade modes with all its extra jumps. Plus, you can import your home garage for the arcade mode. I don't know why the predecessor didn't do that. That's where the real enjoyment comes from, collecting and driving as many different cars as possible rather than legitimately racing opponents. The events with their restrictions are actually just a quicker way to make you choose which car to drive next. It clicks on a certain addiction with every aspect playing its role. The soundtrack, the number of cars available, the simplified controls, and it's all set up in a way that it leaves you on your own to experience. Interactive Car Encyclopedia 
That's the best way to describe GT2. Sure, the world's largest video game garage is full of titles like these nowadays, but Gran Turismo 2 released on December 1999, the other side of the millennium. Sometimes it can be easy to underestimate the impact the Gran Turismo series had on the genre. No other racing game back then had this many cars, circuits, and things to do with it as Gran Turismo 2. GT1 was proof that having hundreds of real-life cars was possible in video game form and there was clearly a market for it. GT2 was at least 95% percent of unfound potential from the predecessor. I mean, not 100% since the developers pushed too hard too fast. The number of bugs is obvious, especially after re-reviewing GT2 again. I realize now that the rush development goes beyond just trophies being out of place in the race menu. You can probably point to this game as the reason why Polyphony Digital take their time with any project nowadays. They would have also been busy working on Gran Turismo 2000 since there were demos out there while they were still developing Gran Turismo 2. Polyphony Digital would have been working light speed during the late 90s it's incredible they reached the checkered flag, let alone place first, if you catch my drift. But anyway, unless you're a 100% completionist, they're more funny than frustrating, really, and again, it's kind of part of Gran Turismo 2's charm. I wouldn't be surprised that if Polyphony were given an extra year, it would have three CDs, including everything promised, and an extra 200 cars. If they had the time, they would. But I digress. To answer the question, is it worth the grind once you overtake it? Yes, absolutely. I had a lot of fun coming back to this game. The nostalgia hit me like an airbag, and while seeing all these real-life cars all pixelated might not look like much. Trust me, as a video game, something with a ton of content that's easy to comprehend and experience, Gran Turismo 2 still holds up today, and is one of the best to come out for the PlayStation towards the tail end of its life cycle, before Sony put focus on the PlayStation 2, where Polyphony Digital had big plans for too. Really big plans.